The America's Democrats podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, is made possible by contributions from our listeners. Want to do more? Go to americasdemocrats.org and click donate. And thank you for allowing us to be your voice. And if you enjoy the show, please share it with your friends on Facebook and Twitter and leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. This week, Frederick Isasi of Families USA on why now is the time for Congress to take a stand on lowering health care costs. Historian Martha S. Jones on her new book, Vanguard, How Black Women Broke Barriers, Won the Vote, and Insisted on Equality for All. Plus, Bill Press with legal analyst Barbara McQuaid on holding Donald Trump responsible for his actions leading up to January 6th. Had enough of Fox News, the House Freedom Caucus, and Donald Trump? If you want the facts that you won't get from them or from the fake news sites of the alt-right, then stay tuned. Our sponsor, 21st Century Democrats, works hard to get everyday Democrats involved in returning our party to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Sit back and listen, then stand up and fight. And follow 21st Century Democrats on Facebook for all the latest progressive news. We're glad you can join us. As Democrats' reconciliation bill makes its way through Congress, health advocates will be closely watching. Frederick Isasi says this is an opportunity to make a critical and necessary investment in the health of every American. And we say hello to Frederick Isasi, Executive Director of Families USA, one of the nation's leading nonpartisan, nonprofit health care advocacy organizations established to ensure that the best health and health care are equally accessible and affordable to all. Frederick Isasi, thank you so much for joining us today on the America's Democrats podcast. You bet, Jim. It's my sincere pleasure. Thanks for inviting us to participate. Absolutely. And our pleasure to have you with us. Now, shortly after the Senate passed its budget reg- resolution, Families USA released a press release stating that, quote, we are on track to implement landmark legislation that would significantly lower health care costs, improve racial and ethnic disparities, and ensure everyone in America can lead a healthier life, close quote. We want to talk specifically about what needs to be in this budget to achieve those goals. So first of all, let's start with Medicare. What are you calling for to preserve and even expand Medicare coverage? Well, you know, uh, to, to start with, we're very excited at Families USA about this opportunity. Um, both President Biden and the Democrats who are in control in the House and Senate have been very clear that they really want to go for it. This may be the most significant moment for health care legislation since passage of the Affordable Care Act um, over a decade ago. So this is a really important opportunity. Um, Absolutely positively, one of the most important opportunities in there is the Medicare program. Um, You know, it's an incredibly important program. Uh, Over 60 million men, women, uh, and children receive coverage in Medicare either because they're elderly or because they're disabled. Um, It's it's one of our most important uh, programs. And in this particular uh, moment, one of the things we're pushing very hard for is to finally, finally create an oral health care benefit. Uh, hearing and vision benefit for uh, Medicare uh, recipients to make sure that they can both take care of their oral health, their vision, their hearing, and um, be financially stable. Now, beyond protecting Medicare, is there more that governments can be doing to make sure health insurance is available to all? Absolutely. Um, And those are other opportunities in this new reconciliation package that's coming together. Uh, the blueprint for which was in the, uh, the uh, budget resolution. So, I mean, first and foremost, what we are seeing, and th- there's really no other way to describe this than a David and Goliath fight, we see an opportunity to lower prescription drug prices for all families in this country. Um, this is quite a moment, uh, as most of the folks listening know, uh, the pharmaceutical industry is uh, arguably the most powerful lobby in the entire country. It's a well over a trillion dollar a year industry. They spend more on lobbying than any other industry, and they know what they're doing. And they are working very hard right now, to, and they have been and very successfully for years, to stop the government from getting in there and stopping their abusive prices. And w- what we're looking at now is an actual moment where we may be able to change federal law to finally let the government get in there and negotiate uh, the prices of prescription drugs to make sure that they're not abusive and they're not out of reach 
for most families. So that's an incredibly important opportunity. It's something that I hope all the listeners will really pay attention to and be engaged in. Um, we need every single voice out there saying that we're fed up with the pricing abuses of the prescription drug uh, manufacturers, and it's time for the government to get in there and make sure we're getting a fair shot. Uh, there's other things in there that we're very concerned about. Um, we wanna make sure that the health insurance uh, plans that are offered to people through the uh, health insurance exchanges are really affordable. And that's about improving the subsidies available for coverage. Um, and we did that during the Recovery Act uh, that we just, or the, the rescue plan that just passed. And we're trying to make those permanent, really, really important. Um, we know that over half of Americans are really concerned about um, affordability of health insurance and healthcare costs. And we know that almost a third of them are actually not taking, for example, their prescription drugs as prescribed because they can't afford to. This affordability issue is central to most families. And then another really important target for us is Medicaid. As, as most of the listeners know, um, during the passage of the Affordable Care Act, we created a new Medicaid benefit for the very most vulnerable people, for those people out there who um, may be making almost no money, you know, maybe have a very limited ability to earn money, may have undiagnosed mental health issues or substance use disorder, housing insecurity, um, before the Affordable Care Act, that group of folks, many of them just simply were not eligible for Medicaid, no matter how poor they were. And we created a new eligibility category so that the poorest, the poor, the folks who are the most vulnerable could get Medicaid. But we know in this country, about 15 states have not expanded Medicaid um, simply because of politics, because they it was tainted with uh, Obamacare and they refused to do it. And so they're most vulnerable in those states currently don't have coverage. And we could finally solve that by creating a federal Medicaid benefit that doesn't have to run through the state. So that's another big push in this package as well. Think of, 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 they could be heroes had they expanded Medicaid. You know, okay. I, they, they, they could be, they could stay in office for a long, long time if they do the right thing. But for whatever reason, as you say, it's politics and, and, and they choose not to. Now, uh, Frederick, Families USA is a strong advocate, of course, for ending skyrocketing healthcare prices. But where do you see the worst abuses happening and how can legislatures rein them in? Yeah, this is such an important point. You know, ultimately, um, the most egregious abuses uh, that we're seeing in pricing is really in the pharmaceutical industry. And what everyone needs to remember is, and this is every time I testify in Congress on this, I say the same thing, which is um, members of Congress, the reason that the pharmaceutical companies are tripling their price in one year or launching at a price that's five times higher than the rest of the world is only for one reason, because Congress gave them that power. Congress granted them that monopoly. And, um, and of course, the pharmaceutical industry sues anyone who tries to end that monopoly. They um, play all kinds of tricks on, uh, in terms of, of what's called evergreening, making sure those patents never go out, even though they were only supposed to last for you know, maybe eight, nine years. Um, and so we see the worst abuses there. Uh, and it's simply put, the industry sets a price and extorts as much as they possibly can out of every single family and the federal taxpayer, um, rakes in huge profits, spends less than half of what they spend on marketing, on research and development. And honestly, I think the thing that's most troubling to me and to many folks out there working on this issue is, as long as we let the pharmaceutical companies play tricks and extend their patents, and um, get smart lawyers to figure out ways so they can keep charging whatever they want for something that's been in the market for years and years and years and years, like take insulin, for example, been on the market for over a hundred years, right? Um, what we're actually doing is disincentivizing those same companies from finding life-saving cures. Um, every day that we let them continue to do this is a, a, one more day where people aren't gonna be getting the, the cures that they deserve. So um, there's lots of reasons why this is a really important fight. There's other examples, healthcare, unfortunately, is one of the most distorted uh, markets in this country. There's all kinds of problems, asymmetric information. We don't know who's a good doctor, who's a bad doctor, who's a good hospital, what's, what's a good hospital, what's a bad hospital, right? We also know that um, there's been a massive consolidation in the healthcare sector around hospitals and corporate physician groups, and they are driving up prices as well. That's another good example of really bad pricing abuses as well. Mm. Just amazing that we're having this conversation in 2021. Yeah, uh, we're, we're speaking to Frederick Isasi, Dr executive director of Families USA. And Frederick, as your organization has made clear, improving access to health care is central to the goals of fairness and equity. And a few years back, Families USA launched the Evidence for Equity initiative. Tell us a bit about the work of this initiative and what you've learned that could help lawmakers who want to close disparities in health care. 
It's so important to say this uh, and to say it really clearly and out loud. You know, um, we are living in a country where you're much more likely to die of, say, a heart attack, one of the most common forms of, um, of, of folks dying in this country. You're twice as likely to die prematurely if you happen to be African-American. We're in a country where moms and babies, um, African-American moms and babies are dying at a much higher rate than their white counterparts. We're in a country where um, you're much less likely to get care for mental illness if you happen to be a person of color. Um, and these are very solid, very well-researched um, data points. And so one of the things that we care deep about at families is ensuring that healthcare truly is available to all. And we see this foundational to every single living soul in our country being able to self-actualize, to live their best life. And so attacking these health inequities and making sure that every single person in this country has a fair shot at health is one of our most uh, important goals. We, we launched a few years ago, the Center on Health Equity uh, Action for System Transformation, which is a long title, but basically what it's focused on is this idea that as we work to really transform healthcare and really make sure that families are finally getting access to health and not just simply the world's most expensive MRI, right? that we really think intentionally about race and ethnicity, uh, geography, folks who live in rural America, and make sure that we're making health equally accessible to every living soul in our country. So it's really, really important. Um, there's a lot of work going on, you know, of course, as we work on things like expanding access to mental health services, expanding access to uh, Medicaid, these are really important priorities for communities of color. Um, we're also very committed to ensuring that all immigrants in our country have access to healthcare because after all, they were our frontline workers. They were the heroes during this pandemic that kept our, our economy and our country going and they deserve health just like everyone else. And then finally, I think one of the deepest efforts that we're undertaking at families is to realign the incentives that the healthcare sector is responding to so that they're actually focusing on delivering health not simply a unit of healthcare, not the world's best MRI or you know, um, best procedure, but actually that each individual person in this country is living their healthiest life. That's a huge endeavor. Um, and it really starts at changing financial incentives. And we think that that opens the door to incredible reforms, things like um, housing insecurity and making sure that housing is viewed as not just simply um, a, a, a part of a person's uh, shelter and, and how they live every day, but actually part of their health, violence, um, pollution, things like that. When we can make the system responsive to the underlying social determinants of health, then we actually will become a much healthier, much more, uh, a, a much more whole society. You know, like the human body, everything's connected. Every, That's right. You know, it's, it's, it's everything leads to something else. And, and this is a perfect example, example of what you just described. Um, as the budget reconciliation process moves forward, what is your sense there is political will to include the priorities that you've identified? I mean, let's, you know, as well as anybody, just one Democrat can derail the process. That's exactly right. Um, and I, so it's really good news there. I mean, I, I'm not sure if the listeners heard about two weeks ago, the president uh, gave a speech and the president, President Biden went out on a limb and said, it is time to end prescription drug pricing abuses. That is one of the most courageous speeches ever in a long time, um, given from a man who's one of our most seasoned senators who really understands how the process works. So we, this is a moment, uh, it's a very real moment. Now, the same thing has happened with regard to improving the affordability of coverage through the subsidy improvements. Medicare oral healthcare benefit also has been discussed very openly and widely. Um, and Medicaid expansion also, the, the question of how do we solve for Medicaid in states that haven't been willing to extend it to their, to their folks. All of these things, the president on down, um, you know, Speaker Pelosi, uh, Majority Leader Schumer, uh, Chairman Wyden of the Finance Committee, these are all of these folks have gone out on a limb and said, we're doing this and we're getting it done. So, you know, the problem with working Congress is uh, it's almost always um, harder to get done than anyone could ever imagine. So every step of the way, this is going to be a fight, but we actually have a shot here and we're putting it, we're going all in and we're going to work uh, our tails off to use this opportunity to make sure that health is as fair and equitably uh, available on American families as we possibly can. And I definitely want to say for folks who are listening, um, please come to our website, familiesusa.org, and you can sign up, you can get involved, you can become part of our advocacy community um, and help us drive this country towards a much more just, much more fair uh, place. And the more people that do get involved 
the better chance for resolution of these problems that really just shouldn't exist any longer. Uh, Frederick Isasi, Executive Director of Families USA, joining us today on the America's Democrats podcast. Again, the website, if you'd like to get involved, familiesusa.org. Frederick, we appreciate your time with us today. We'd love to have you back again soon. Anytime, Jim. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. And this is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen to this AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats. But we need you to stand up and fight. Do you want to get involved and help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box? You can make your contribution to help us keep this show going and to elect Democrats who will stand up for Democratic principles. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. I believe that we must pass legislation to provide medical care. This is our tradition. When our grandparents came to America, it was the Democratic Party which said, Welcome. It was the Democratic Party, the party of Roosevelt and Truman and Kennedy and others, who said that America belonged to all its people, not just a handful of the rich or a few giant corporations. That's why great leaders like FDR fought so hard for Social Security and why JFK stood up to the insurance companies and their Republican allies to get Medicare. It's not just one thing or one time in one place. It's about a whole history of standing up to the Republicans and saying someone has to be on the side of regular working people in America, whether it's defending Social Security or just the way your loved ones are treated on the job. That's what the Democratic Party is all about. And that's why this message has been brought to you by the Democratic Party. Working people like you and me. Paid for by 21st Century Democrats. Not authorized by any candidate or candidate's committee. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. Coming up next, why black women in America had to wage their own fight for the vote and how they won. But first, we turn to Jim Hightower, America's number one populist, for his Common Sense Commentary. Corporate ideologues never cease blathering that government programs should be run like a business. Really? What business would they choose? Pharmaceutical profiteers? Big oil? Wall Street money manipulators? High-tech billionaires? Airline price gougers? The good news is that the great majority of people aren't buying this corporate blather. Instead, valuing institutions that prioritize the common good. Thus, by a two-to-one margin, Americans have stunned smug right-wing privatizers by specifically declaring in a recent poll that our U.S. Postal Service should not be run like a business. Indeed, an overwhelming majority, including half of Republicans, say mail delivery should be run as a, quote, public service, even if that costs more. In fact, having proven that this 246-year-old federal agency can consistently and efficiently deliver to 161 million homes and businesses day after day, it's time to let the agency's trusted, decentralized, well-trained workforce provide even more services for our communities. How about postal banking? Yes, the existing network of some 31,000 post offices in metro neighborhoods and small towns across America are perfectly situated and able to provide basic banking services to the one out of four of us who don't have or can't afford bank accounts. The giant banking chains ignore these millions, leaving them at the mercy of check-cashing exploiters and payday loan sharks. The post office can offer simple, honest banking, including small-dollar checking and savings accounts, very low-interest consumer loans, low-fee debit cards, etc., The goal of postal banking is not to maximize corporate profits, but public service. This is Jim Hightower saying, we the people own this public asset. To enable it to work even better for us, go to agrandalliance.org. The Hightower Radio Lowdown is brought to you by the Lowdown Happy Hour, now live streaming on Facebook from the Chat and Chew Cafe. So grab a libation, pull up a virtual chair, and join our freewheeling conversations with political mavericks, musical agitators, and kick-ass grassroots groups. The Lowdown Happy Hour will connect you to good trouble activists who are building people power across America. Get the Lowdown at HightowerLowdown.org. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. 
In her newest book, acclaimed historian Martha S. Jones writes about the black women who fought for the vote even after the 19th Amendment was passed. It's a little-known history, but one that is essential to understanding the evolution of democracy in America. And we say hello to Professor Martha Jones, the Society of Black Alumni Presidential Professor, Professor of History, and a professor at the SNF Agora Institute at the Johns Hopkins University. She's also a legal and cultural historian who, whose work examines how black Americans have shaped the story of American democracy and is the author most recently of Vanguard, How Black Women Broke Barriers, Won the Vote, and Insisted on Equality for All, which was selected as one of Time's 100 must-read books for 2020. Professor Martha Jones, thanks very much for joining us today on the America's Democrats podcast. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you. It is our pleasure to have you with us. So the 19th Amendment, as most people know, secured the right to vote for women in 1920, but not all women. How were black women excluded from this accomplishment? Yeah, thank you for that. You know, um, I think there are two uh, myths that surround the 19th Amendment. Um, the one is that the amendment guaranteed to all American women the right to vote. Well, not quite. It prohibits states from using sex as a criteria when it comes to voting rights, but still many American women cannot vote based upon citizenship, residency, um, so-called mental competence. It was still true in 1920 that American women who married non-citizens were denaturalized and hence lost their right to vote. But as you suggest, for African-American women, there are an additional set of hurdles. And these are what we oftentimes refer to as Jim Crow laws, literacy tests, uh, grandfather clauses, understanding clauses, poll taxes. These are um, strategies that mostly Southern states have used since the end of the 19th century to keep African-American men away from the polls. And these laws, along with intimidation and violence in 1920 and beyond, will also keep many Black American women from the polls. However, uh, it is also true that many states have already enacted women's suffrage. And so Black women do vote, importantly, in states like California, in New York, in Illinois, even in 1920. Um, and so when we look out over the national landscape after the November 2020, uh, 1920 election season, um, we recognize what an uneven terrain that is, um, a um, set of disappointments for Black women that require them to continue to fight for voting rights. And you've written that ratification of the 19th Amendment was a clarifying moment for Black women. So in what ways was this the case? It's clarifying in the sense that um, it affirms um, what many of the proponents um, of the 19th Amendment had um, assumed, um, which was that nothing in the amendment would prevent individual states from using state laws, um, from countenancing intimidation and violence that would indeed disenfranchise African American women. There was no magic pill, um, no um, defining moment in 1920 for African American women. Um, this is the talk around the amendment as it is coming up for ratification. And that fall of 1920, um, those um, predictions are now confirmed. Mm -hmm. Now, it wasn't until 1965, of course, the passage of, of the Voting Rights Act that racial discrimination uh, was uh, in voting was prohibited. But black women were hardly content to stay on the political sidelines until then. What are some of the ways they expressed their political voice before 1965? You're so right to point out that African Americans do not simply sit down in the face of the disappointments of 1920, and instead they uh, embrace the challenge of now building a new movement for voting rights um, in that has three major threads. Um, the first is a legal campaign largely spearheaded by the NAACP um, that is using the constitution to successfully challenge grandfather clauses and poll taxes and whites only primaries. 
opening the door a little wider for African-American women voters in the years leading up to 1965. At the same time, um, this is a moment in which Black women are in the trenches um, doing the um, nitty gritty work of American politics in every election season. Um, they are registering as they can, casting ballots as they can, moving the needle in some places on election day, most memorably in Chicago, where Black women are not only organized, they are Republican Party operatives in the 1920s, um, they are voting as a block. And as a consequence, for example, they are able to send the first African American man to Congress um, since 1901. In 1928, Oscar de Priest goes to Washington, very much a credit to Black women's in the trenches voter activism, even in the face of discrimination. Now, the story or the prong of this story that's most familiar to most of us, of course, is the civil rights movement. Um, and by the 1940s, Black women are um, the architects, the masterminds, um, the um, organizers, and the foot soldiers of what becomes the modern civil rights revolution, um, all the way through to 1964. And that fateful Selma campaign that gives us those marches across the um, Pettus Bridge um, and really holds the feet of Lyndon Johnson and Congress, the Democratic Party and the nation, frankly, to the fire of Black voting rights. And Black women are a part of this movement as well. Um, so this is a long campaign, 45 years from the 19th Amendment, um, but it is one um, because it is multifaceted, because it is involves women's leadership as well as their grassroots uh, resistance um, on the ground. Um, it is one that successfully wins for the entire country the protections of a Voting Rights Act for the very first time. Is it accurate to say these women pioneered the idea of intersectionality that we talk about so much today? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, yes, um, this book um, that I've written, Vanguard, begins 200 years ago um, with Black women's ideas. Um, because in order to build a social movement, one must have um, some well-formed and robust ideas that undergird that women. And for Black women, what that means is 200 years ago already, developing a critique that simultaneously takes on racism and sexism, that a sort of analysis that we call intersectionality today. Um, that is a lonely um, quest for Black women in this country for a very long time. Um, and if the idea in the 21st century that neither racism nor sexism should arbitrate political rights in our nation, um, if that seems commonsensical almost to us in the 21st century, we have Black women activists um, to thank for that because for a very long time in our history, um, they were alone in championing that sort of vision. Absolutely. We're speaking to Professor Martha Jones, a Society of Black Alumni Presidential Professor, Professor of History, and a professor at the SNF Agora Institute at the Johns Hopkins University, and the author most recently of Vanguard, How Black Women Broke Barriers, Won the Vote, and Insisted on Equality for All. It, Martha, some of the amazing women you write about, we've heard of, such as Ida B. Wells, but some are far less well-known. Tell us about Hallie Quinn Brown. Thank you for that. <laughs> Your questions are wonderful, if I could just say. Um, Hallie Quinn Brown is someone, um, when I first had an opportunity to write um, uh, for the Smithsonian Magazine, and they asked me who I wanted to pluck out of Vanguard, it was indeed Hallie Quinn Brown. I was very moved because the Library of Congress had an exhibition um, that, only, that not only showed some of her papers, her writing, uh, but some extraordinary photographs of her as a young woman activist. So Hallie Quinn Brown um, is an educator um, a, an activist in the African Methodist Episcopal Church. And by the end of the 19th century, she has also emerged as a suffragist and a leader within the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs, which is the largest um, Black women's 
political organization of the late 19th and early 20th century. Hallie Quinn Brown um, heads the suffrage department in, in the NACWC in the years leading up to ratification of the 19th Amendment. But by 1920, she's president of that organization. And she is charged with now helping Black women assess the disappointments of the 19th Amendment and chart that way forward um, to the Voting Rights Act. Um, what does that mean? It means in part, Hallie Quinn Brown is going to face off with figures like Alice Paul, the leader, the legendary leader of the National Women's Party, someone so critical to winning the 19th Amendment. Brown is gonna face over with Paul about whether the National Women's Party will lend its support to African-American women in their ongoing quest for voting rights. The short answer is no. Brown, uh, uh, Alice Paul moves on to champion um, the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, so Hallie Quinn Brown is going to work with the women in the NACWC to organize um, into what we come to recognize as the civil rights movement. At the same time, she authors a wonderful book called Homespun Heroines, which is one of our earliest chronicles published in 1926, one of the earliest chronicles um, uh, that looks at the long story of Black women's political activism in the United States, uses their biographies to make the case, to reinforce the case that Black women have long earned the privilege of citizenship and full political rights in the United States. She is characteristic of many of the women in this book. She works on many fronts, um, and which is to say within church politics, within party politics, within her own women's clubs, and then with her pen, um, she really exemplifies the kind of versatility that Black women need to bring to the formidable challenges that they face um, if they hope to secure voting rights. And she is an amazing human being and, and, and wonderful to read about, but she's not alone. And in fact, Fanny Barrier Williams, your own great grandmother, is also part of this story. Can you tell us about her, please? So I'll just correct you and say that my great grandmother is Fanny uh, Miller Williams, um, not to be confused with Fanny Barrier Williams. Oh, my apologies. Two, but two important um, figures in this story, absolutely. Um, but one of the things about writing Vanguard was that I realized um, that I needed to know more about the women in my own family um, as I was writing this larger than life history. Um, and I knew too little, frankly, about where they had been and how they had been part of this extraordinary movement for voting rights that Black women engage in over two centuries. I'm very lucky to find my great grandmother, um, Fannie Miller Williams in St. Louis, Missouri in 1920. Um, she's an activist there. Um, through the Phyllis Wheatley branch of the YWCA, um, named for the 18th century enslaved poet. Um, there, Black women in 1920 run a suffrage school. Why? Because it's necessary for them to teach one another, to train one another how to pay a poll tax how to pass a literacy test, um, how to endure um, a quiz about the most complex facets of the US Constitution as they go to register to vote. Um, this is how women in St. Louis, um, Black women in St. Louis, overcome those Jim Crow barriers. They even get some African-American men who turn out to their suffrage schools who are going to take advantage of this opportunity um, to, again, attempt to overcome the legal um, barriers. Um, so she is busy in 1920 um, preparing herself, but preparing women like her um, to uh, get to the polls. And if the newspaper accounts are correct, um, in the city of St. Louis, um, where women are voting for the very first time in 1920, nearly all women, black and white, um, successfully register. The last thing I'll say is that part of the reason women like Fannie Williams are so um, set on preparing themselves to vote is not simply to realize the promise um, or the possibilities of the 19th Amendment, though it is partly that. They need to vote because the city of St. Louis is in the midst of setting in place new draconian housing segregation codes that will separate Black from white 
residents of St. Louis for the first time, and they're using voter referenda to get those laws in place. And so Black women turn out at the polls with a kind of urgency because, yes, they are realizing their possibilities as American women in political life, but also because they are Black Americans whose communities are being subject now to Jim Crow segregation for the very first time. As was widely noted when your book was first published in 2020, this history is not one that is very well known. Why has that been the case and how did that influence how you did your research? The number one remark I get about this story is goes something like, why didn't I learn this in school? Um, and the first thing I have to say is I didn't learn this in school either. Um, and I'm someone as a historian who believes that part of our charge is, is writing the histories we need to read. And Vanguard was the book I needed to read coming into 2020 and that um, hotly contested election cycle in order to understand deeply the roles that Black women would play. But why we didn't learn this and we haven't learned this before is a poignant question because it leads us to look back at the earliest histories of the movement for women's suffrage. And when we do, those histories that were off authored by women like Susan Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, names that are legends in our popular imagination of the movement, women like Stanton and Anthony wrote histories, um, in their case, uh, six volumes and nearly 6,000 pages of the history of a movement. And they told it from their point of view. They told it from the perspective of their facet of the movement. And that meant that much of the story that I tell in Vanguard, which does not happen in the organizations led by women like Stanton and Anthony, is omitted. It is erased. And frankly, historians, if you will, bought it. And we used those texts as a kind of Bible um, for understanding the history of the movement. And it's not until the 1970s when um, the great historian, Dr. Rosalind Turborg Penn, goes back to those volumes looking deliberately for Black women that she really cracks the code and teaches us about what has been omitted and then charges us um, with discovering the histories that are yet to be written. You know, and sadly, we're at a time when voting rights are coming under attack with restrictive new voting laws being proposed and passed in GOP led states. What can we learn from this history about why we are in this place today and how to fight back? One of the things I learned writing Vanguard was that across the long history of this country, um, voting rights and voter suppression have always been companion stories. And we've talked today about 1920 as one example of the expansion of voting rights for many American women, and yet the suppression of the voting rights of African American women. Um, so in some sense, we can recognize the dynamics that we are confronting today um, by virtue of that lens from history. There are some lessons, I think. Um, the first is there is no um, shortcut in American politics around that work that we do each election cycle in the trenches. And Black women do that work at great personal cost, oftentimes, um, even in the face of um, rampant voter suppression, violence, and intimidation. Um, we must do that work day in and day out, each and every election cycle. That's one. We have to be in the trenches. That's where politics happens. At the same time, the women in Vanguard, when they got the podium, they got the microphone, um, or they got the editorial page, always spoke of their highest, their best ideals, Right. They called for universal voting rights. They decried the influence of racism, sexism. They spoke of voting in human rights terms, which is to say that in order to animate their work, in order to sustain their work, they also had to have big ideas 
and to champion those big ideas at every turn. Voter, voting rights are not simply, um, you know, the mechanics of democracy um, or the pragmatic road, right, to material benefits. For the women I write about, they really were the heart of democracy. And we need to say that and to remind ourselves and as the women in Vanguard do, equip the next generations to do the long haul work of democracy. Um, one of the things I admire so much about these women is that they bring up their daughters, their students, the next generations of young women to continue the struggle. And I think that is part of where we are in 2021 is looking to ourselves, um, but also understanding that part of our charge is to train next generations to champion democracy, even in the face of American voter suppression. Amen. The title of the book, Vanguard, How Black Women Broke Barriers, Won the Vote, and Insisted on Equality for All. Again, selected as one of Time's 100 must-read books for 2020. The author, Professor Martha Jones, joining us today on the America's Democrats podcast. Martha, we appreciate your time very much. Would love to have you back again soon. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. And this is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Make your contribution to keep the America's Democrats dot org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats on the air and help elect stand up Democrats. Go to America's Democrats dot org and click on donate at the top of the page. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand up Democrats. And now Bill Press talks with former U.S. attorney Barbara McQuaid on why a failure to open a criminal investigation into Trump's role in the January insurrection would undermine democracy. If you don't hold accountable people who are responsible for the January 6th insurrection and also the efforts that Donald Trump has undertaken to undermine public confidence in our elections, then I think you risk the possibility that someone will just do it again and maybe this time do it better. You have written uh, in the Washington Post together with Lawrence Tribe and, and Joyce Vance that the Department of Justice should conduct an investigation of Donald Trump's role. Uh, are you talking about a criminal investigation? And if so, based on what evidence? Yeah, I think there is already sufficient what's called predication to begin a criminal investigation. Predication just means I have some facts to suggest that there is a crime that may have been committed here, as opposed to just a wild fishing expedition. You know, I, I don't like Bill Press, so I'm just going to start investigating him to see if he's committed any crimes. That, that would be in, in, improper. But if there is some basis to suggest that a crime has been committed, then it's absolutely proper. And in some instances, in a case like this with such grave importance, uh, there is a need to conduct an investigation. So I, I think an investigation should already have begun. Maybe it has, and the Justice Department is just doing what it normally does, which is keep investigations quiet. I don't know if you immediately name Donald Trump as a target, but certainly I think you want to investigate all people who are involved in that insurrection. That, that investigation is, of course, ongoing. We know that the people who are at the Capitol that day have been charged with crimes. And as the U.S. attorney in the District of Columbia promised at that initial press conference to take that investigation as high as it goes so that we can determine was was there somebody at the top who was coordinating all of these efforts or was this really just uh, some public statements and some people got a little bit rowdy and out of hand? I think from all the, the coordinated lawsuits we've seen, I think the letter that Jeffrey Clark, the acting attorney general for the civil division, wrote after meeting with Donald Trump. Uh, he had prepared that for Acting Attorney General Jeffrey Rosen's signature, reaching out to Georgia and sharing with Georgia a roadmap of how it could invalidate the, its election and instead throw the election to its legislature. And there's mm -hmm. reporting that he prepared that letter for six states. And that strikes me as perhaps the stuff of a conspiracy. I think that there needs to be an investigation to satisfy us that uh, wh whether there was or wasn't some kind of criminal activity. And for Donald Trump himself, what evidence would you say exists that at least merits a criminal investigation? 
what did he do that you you would add up as one or two or three things? I think this effort to sort of just say we won. Uh, we know that on election night he came out and said we won. He's gone. Uh, his lawyers have gone into court to say we won. The phone call with uh, the Raffensperger of, of Georgia, yeah, mm -hmm. and um, uh, saying you need to find me eleven thousand some votes. His public statements at the ellipse on the day of the insurrection. You know, I think those words alone are not going to be enough. But I think if you combine all of these factors as well as his urging to Jeffrey Clark uh, to find some way, the pressure he put on uh, Jeffrey Rosen at the Department of Justice, the pressure that he applied to all of those DOJ officials, I think is also some evidence of criminal wrongdoing by Donald Trump himself. So what about the policy, the Department of Justice policy, which we saw played out in, uh, in the Mueller investigation, the conclusion of it, final report, that you cannot indict a president of the United States. Yeah, well, that only went as so far as you can't indict a sitting president of the United States. And if you read the Office of Legal Counsel opinion uh, that gives us that policy, you'll see that the reasons for it is it would be an undue distraction for the president mm -hmm. to be indicted. It would make it difficult for him to govern. It would be challenging for him to interact with the heads of other governments. And so uh, those things that apply to a sitting president, though, don't apply to someone once they're out of office. And so I don't think it applies, even if his conduct occurred while he was president. Certainly, you can't charge him with a crime for his policy choices, even if you disagree with them. Uh, but this would be violation of actual statutes. It's sort of a tangent, but I remember well, because I was covering the White House every day uh, when President Obama took office. And there were a lot of, there's a lot of pressure on him, a lot of calls, particularly from member, Democratic members of Congress, to indict uh, have the Justice Department investigate and indict George Bush and Dick Cheney for war crimes, particularly because of the torture. Yeah. Uh, uh, and uh, Obama chose not to do so. Uh, what's the difference here? Or is there a difference? Yes. I, there, you know, I, of course, I haven't seen the evidence that they had against President Bush and Vice President Cheney. I don't know whether it was strong evidence. But there are two questions that prosecutors have to ask themselves. One is, can we charge a crime here? Is there sufficient evidence uh, that a crime was been, has been committed? Can we prove each of these elements at a trial? The second and harder and more important question is, should we charge this crime? Mm -hmm. uh, not every, That's how prosecutors use their discretion every day. Not every violation of the law merits federal charges. The question is whether there's a substantial federal interest. And I think there are a lot of things that someone would have to weigh in thinking about that. Uh, the risk uh, and probably the calculation that was done by Attorney General Holder during the Obama administration is, is this worth it or does it set a precedent that we will become a country where every new president indicts his predecessor? And I don't think we want that to happen. And so I think it needs to be reserved for truly extraordinary conduct. What President Bush did and what Vice President Cheney did may have been out of bounds. It may even have violated war crimes. I don't know. But everything they were doing had in mind the best interest of the country in their view. They were working to, uh, to mm -hmm. do their jobs. They may have overreached, I don't know, but they were, what they were doing was what they believed was right to serve the country. What Donald Trump did was not to serve the country. It was great harm to the country. It was to serve himself. And I think that's the difference. And uh, the difference may be that this, uh, his actions combined may have uh, added up to uh, a coup, to use the maybe overused word. Do you believe that it does amount to a coup, that he was really attempting to overthrow the legitimate government of the United States? I think that Donald Trump was trying to create enough chaos to uh, throw, for in his first efforts, to throw some of the elections uh, into the state legislatures that were controlled by Republicans, because he only needed a few states to, to swing his way. You know, Georgia, Michigan, look at all the places where he filed lawsuits. Right. I think when those efforts failed, he then tried to do the same thing in the Congress. If he could create enough chaos there and get enough people to vote against certification, then that throws the election into the House. And you might say, well, the House had more Democrats than Republicans, so what's the point? But the way the voting works mm -hmm. is each state gets one delegation. And when you count the math that way, Republicans actually had the majority. And so that was one path to his electoral victory.
And so is it a coup? I don't know if it's a coup. It's a diabolically clever way to try to undermine uh, democracy in America. Right. Uh, and one could argue, I believe, to overthrow the legitimately elected new president of the United States. Yes. Um, from what you've seen, uh, the evidence that you've, you've, uh, you've looked at, did Donald Trump incite the insurrection on January 6th by his comments? I think he, uh, I think in one sense, in the generic sense of the word, yes, he did incite. Is it sufficient for uh, crim- criminal? There is a, 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 a crime uh, for inciting violence um, that can be charged criminally. There is a test, a legal test, because of the First Amendment tensions there. You know, he would say, I just gave a fiery political speech and people do that all the time. They urge people to fight. We have to fight for our rights. You hear that all the time. And I think the standard is a case um, where the Supreme Court said the test is whether the person intended to incite violence and whether it was reasonable that the audience took it that way. And so I think the audience took it that way. They, <laughs> they marched down they yeah. marched down in Pennsylvania Avenue, just as he said. They went into, and they fought for their rights and they went to take their country back. So um, the question would be, what was Donald Trump's intent? And that can be very difficult to ascertain, but not impossible. And that's where investigations are important. You talk to people around him to ask what was his goal that day? What was his purpose? Uh, was he talking to people in Congress about uh, this sort of a breach or about even if he didn't know exactly what was going to happen, creating enough chaos and disruption that they'd have to shut the vote down. Uh, That may have been the simple goal. I don't know that he envisioned people losing their lives and engaging in violence and spreading feces on the walls of the rotunda. Um, So uh, could that be a crime? I think we're not there yet. I think you would want to see what uh, the evidence of his intent was. Did he intend to incite violence? And certainly some of the people who were uh, terrorists who were at the Capitol did say they were there because Donald yes. Trump sent them there. One yeah, of them so, there. I, so right. I think that second prong is, is I, I think, pretty easily met. You know, if a fact finder like a jury would have to decide, would that be a reasonable interpretation from a listener who was in the audience? You know, you might say, uh, give a, a very uh, garden variety speech. And if someone uh, who is uh, mentally unstable takes your words and then uses it to go kill somebody, that that wouldn't be enough. But if it's reasonable, if if people in that crowd would say, yep, he's he's sending us down there. Let's go. And you're right. That that was the effect on some of those people. Uh, I think that is good evidence that um, it was reasonably understood that way. And we know that Donald Trump was not the only one to give some incendiary remarks at that January 6th rally. Uh, uh, certainly, Rudy Giuliani and uh, Congressman Mo Brooks would be added to the list. Could they also be brought into this investigation, and should they be by the Department of Justice? Yes, I think you also need to look at wh- whether there was a, a concerted effort. That's where you know a potential conspiracy can come into play. If they said the three of us together are going to give the most fiery speech we can think of, because our goal is to get these people mad and riled up and get down there and shut down that vote. I mean, all we need is. Uh, you know, enough chaos down there that they'll get those, they'll clear the chamber. They'll get those members of Congress out of there. I mean, my gosh, we've got the vice president of the United States down there. We've got the vice president elect down there. Uh, Let's rile them up. So if that's the case, but you know, we had Rudy Giuliani saying, I think his words were trial by combat. Uh, So uh, that is certainly beyond, I think, sort of garden variety, fiery political speech. And, uh, but I, I think the on their face alone, It is not enough, but I think it does merit further investigation going all the way back to election night when Giuliani said to Trump, uh, just say we won. That's our strategy. We're just going to say we won. We're going to continue to pump uh, the country with this disinformation until enough people believe it. Now, I'm interested that you said that it's possible that the Department of Justice might already have this kind of, uh, such an investigation underway. Really? They could do that and we wouldn't know about it? Yes, in fact, we're not supposed to know about most investigations. <laughs> we we know right. about yeah. this investigation only because of you know what happened was so very public. And so ordinarily, the Justice Department is to neither confirm nor deny even the existence of an investigation, except when necessary to assure the public. And so because everyone saw, you know, this horrible thing unfold on January 6th, uh, it was necessary to come out and say, we are investigating and we will hold people accountable. And even that day, they did announce that they would 
take this to the highest levels and find out if anybody was involved in planning this and would hold them accountable. So I think that investigation gives them the leeway to go all the way up to the president if they believe they've got uh, sufficient evidence to do that. To date, we've seen, you know, kind of the low hanging fruit, right. people who were um, entering a restricted area, for example, and have pled guilty, mm-hmm. people who have assaulted officers. There have even been some, you know, Oath Keepers and some of these other groups who've been charged with conspiracy to obstruct an official proceeding, you know, by showing up and um, forcing Congress to shut down uh, those proceedings that day. Uh, and they did have some pre-planning where they had a variety of people with walkie-talkies and other kinds of things. So we've reached that level. I think the next question is, how does it go higher? You know, there have been reports of uh, photos of, of uh, um, Roger Stone at the Trump International Hotel the night before meeting with some of the people who were there uh, at the Capitol on January 6th. Was, was that just a coincidence? Does he just happen to know these guys? Or was there some sort of planning going on? Who funded them? I think we need to get to the bottom of that. Um, who was getting the word out? Who was making sure everybody was there? Uh, and, and what role, if any, did President Trump or, you know, he, 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 we have seen before that he is smart enough to pattern his behavior in the same way that we see the mob conduct their enterprises. You know, I, I don't get my hands dirty. And so I find other people uh, to do these things for me. But were there some of his associates who were paying people uh, or helping to organize these activities? Um, there was, uh, you know, a, a women's rights group that was involved in mm-hmm. planning this. Uh, they they sponsored the, the rights, for example. They sponsored the rally, I believe. Yeah, and, yeah. and you, know, you have to be very careful because political activity is certainly protected uh, and sponsoring a rally is not criminal on its face. But the FBI is not permitted to investigate people based solely on First Amendment protected activity. If instead there are facts to suggest that they are supporting this insurrection, then that is not solely based on their First Amendment activity. It is also based on facts to suggest that they were seeking to obstruct, at the very least, obstruct a session of Congress. That alone is a serious crime. But if the ultimate goal is to change the outcome of the election, then I think it's it's far more nefarious. In fact, uh, speaking of the low-hanging fruit, I mean, you've argued and written for MSNBC that in a murder trial, for example, you don't just go after the hitman. The prosecutor has to look at who hired the hitman, correct? That's your analogy? Yeah, exactly. I, I, right. And that's exactly the way organized crime o- operates. Uh, you know, you find some underlings to do the dirty work and get their hands dirty. Uh, and you stay, you know, a couple degrees of separation away so that you have some deniability about your involvement. As you said, in a when there's a hit, uh, it's not enough that you charge the hit man. You want to get to the bottom of who hired the hit man. And I think that's an apt analogy here. We've got all these people showing up. Did they did this just arise organically? Were they just really mad? I think at the very least, President Trump and his associates were riling them up with false information. Uh, you know, one analogy is to organized crime. Another, frankly, is to terrorist organizations. And that is the playbook of uh, mm-hmm. Anwar al-Awlaki. He would uh, preach on uh, on the Internet and people would see this. He would you know, rile them up and get them angry uh, and incite them to action. And so I don't know that President Trump went so far as to uh, incite killing or violence per se, but he certainly wanted to disrupt the peaceful transfer of power. I popped into my head as you were speaking that we actually started a war in Afghanistan to go after the man who hired those who conducted the terrorist attacks on September 11. Exactly. If the Department of Justice were to limit its investigation and its actions, criminal actions against those who invaded the Capitol on, on January 6th and did not go up the chain, did not go after uh, Donald Trump or Rudy Giuliani uh, and others, if they took no action at all, did not follow up at the criminal level there, what impact would that have, do you believe, on the country, on the on our legal system? Well, of course, they can only file charges if they find sufficient evidence to yes. prove a case. And I think it would take an awful lot. Um, I know that no one is above the law and all people should be treated equally. But I think for the reasons we discussed earlier with regard to President Obama's decision about his predecessors, or Eric Holder's decisions about uh, predecessors to the Obama administration, I think it is a decision that the attorney general would not take lightly. I think he would want to make sure the evidence is overwhelming. Um, but if they fail to take action, I do think there is 
a concern about what that bodes for the future. One of the reasons we prosecute people, I think sometimes uh, we think only about public safety and removing from the community, incapacitating people who are dangerous. You know, the Boston Marathon bomber had to be removed from the streets because he was dangerous. Dylan Roof had to be removed from the streets because he was dangerous. But another reason that we prosecute people is for deterrence. You can't get away with it. If you do this bad thing, uh, there will be a price to pay. And not only does it deter the individual who gets caught, but it also deters everybody else who's watching. And so uh, if there is no deterrence in this case, you can imagine somebody who's watching this, who says, I see how this game is played. Trump was pretty clumsy about this, but I can think of a way to do this in a much smoother way. I'm going to follow this playbook but I'm going to start my disinformation campaign earlier, or I'm going to hire some more credible people, or uh, I can think of a different way legally to abuse the legal process uh, to to win. And I, I think that it tends to undermine the effectiveness of our elections. I also think that all the things that President Trump has done has really undermined public confidence in our elections. Uh, you know, he keeps talking about how they're rigged. He starts that he even even in 2016, you remember, he started talking about the rigged election. If he hadn't won, I am sure we would have been hearing the same things in 2016. But to his great surprise and that of many others, uh, he actually won that election. So suddenly no word about the election being rigged, right? Uh, we don't care because he won. Uh, but when he loses, then it's all rigged, you know, undermining confidence in voting by mail, which is something we absolutely should be doing more of, especially during a pandemic. And so all of those things have been so harmful. And so um, to, uh, to just let it go, I think would be a mistake. If there is a rigorous investigation and a decision is made that the evidence just is not sufficient to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt, um, then, then that's an understandable position. And letting it go could certainly maybe convince some future president, right? That mm -hmm. he, he can get away with the same thing. Yeah, if sure. He, if, so, he's clever, if he's clever enough. Yeah, any any candidate for office could could think about this. And whether it's a president or someone running for governor, or maybe it works even better if you're running for dog catcher, no matter what level, anything that undermines the integrity of our elections and even the perception of the integrity of our elections, I think is very harmful to democracy and everything this country stands for. <laughs> Bill Press with Barbara McQuaid, former U.S. attorney and MSNBC legal analyst. If you'd like to hear the entire episode, visit BillPressPods.com. And that's all for the America's Democrats podcast. Thank you to all who made today's show possible. Frederick Isasi, Martha S. Jones, and the entire Bill Press team. And thank you for listening. If you liked what you heard, please get involved on in our efforts to keep this show going and to elect Democrats who are bringing the party back to its roots. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. And be sure to find 21st Century Democrats on Facebook and Twitter. And leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. For the America's Democrats podcast, I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Join us. Support the AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, and help elect Democrats who will stand up for democratic principles with your contribution today. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. <laughs>